Well, uh, I'm going to talk about long tail e-commerce and uh, it's clearly a topic that's dear to the heart of Amazon and it's also dear to the heart of me in particular because I run the marketplace side of Amazon's operation here. Now, um, the first uh, long tail that I'm going to talk about is the long tail of product range. And uh, for many of you, this is going to be a bit of a refresher. Um, Amazon Books, we don't uh, release sales data um, to show the distribution of book sales. However, there are a number of public studies that are out there that uh, actually have pretty good data about it. And so Eric Brynolfsson, an economist at MIT, has done this study. And we've got cumulative sales on the vertical axes. And we've got the sales rank of Amazon Books here, uh, here on the lower axis. And essentially what his study showed was that 37% of Amazon book sales were beyond the top 100K sales rank. And uh, this is a really huge proportion. Now, the tail is very long. This stretches out to you know, maybe the 30 million books that Amazon has in its catalog. Um, each one is selling very few, but collectively it accounts for a large proportion of our sales. And the implication for you is really to think about how much of the long tail in your categories are you missing. And uh, it's not just a media thing. Um, Zappos, for example, which Amazon acquired last year, they, uh, they offer more than three million shoes, um, which is really an incredibly deep tail in that, in that category. Um, and uh, one of the other interesting things about the long tail, which probably you haven't heard about, is who's actually buying this stuff. So um, there are a couple of ways that you can get to this result. At one extreme, you have uh, a small proportion of people who are highly eccentric um, buying up this, uh, these, these low selling products. At the other extreme, you can have everybody who sometimes is a little bit quirky and buys something in the tail. And so the next type of long tail that I wanted to talk to you about is the long tail of each customer. I'm going to jump to Yahoo now. Yahoo uh, Research actually released some data earlier this year, um, and this is actually just an individual customer. So this is, uh, on the vertical axis, the songs that this Yahoo customer reviewed favorably. Um, and what you can see is that 10% of the songs he reviewed favorably uh, were not included in the top 50,000 albums. And the most interesting thing about this is this wasn't an oddball. The, this customer actually, more than 70% of Yahoo Music reviewers had a distribution that was at least this spread. They were at least this quirky. And so the implication of this research is that at least in music, uh, you were all a little bit quirky sometimes. Um, now, I wanted to think about whether this holds outside of music in other categories as well. So I did a very, very small sample. Um, an Amazon customer, let's call her Mrs. Henderson, let me uh, check out her um, orders on Amazon. You can go into your account on Amazon, hope you're all shoppers there, you can do a similar thing. And you can click through and see the sales rank of all of the products that you've bought. So I did this, turns out Mrs. Henderson has been a bit of a shopaholic this year, 117 purchases, um, and after being uh, initially dismayed, I looked through at the, uh, at the sales rank of these products, and uh, 11 of the 117 were actually beyond a sales rank of 200,000. 200,000 is, uh, is an interesting number, I chose it because um, Tesco.com, I was playing around on their site, and, and they still have uh, nowhere near that selection. And so this is really deep in the tail, and yet it accounted for a little more than 9% of my wife's purchases on Amazon. The, the implication from this is um, if most of your customers are a little bit quirky, then chances are they may be disappointed by your selection at least sometimes. And so maybe it's only one in every 10 times they come to your website or your online store or your physical store um, and can't find what they want. But if they can't, they may start visiting somewhere else to start their shopping experience. 
And so uh, this sort of tale, the tale of each customer, can have a big bearing. The, um, the next type of tale I wanted to talk about is the distribution of sales across stores. And uh, if you take um, UK e-commerce sites, we've now got uh, cumulative traffic on the vertical axes and a ranking of e-commerce sites from the most trafficked uh, in the UK to the least trafficked at the end. Um, now, before I put this data together, I was expecting it to be a very, very long tail. I mean, there's clearly a ton of e-commerce websites out there. And there is a long tail, but actually it's very shallow. And what I mean by that is once you get up past uh, 100 in terms of e-commerce sites in the UK, you've actually only got 40% of remaining site visits left. So the, the long tail doesn't account for a very large proportion of, uh, of site visits. And it's actually pretty concentrated. So if you look at the top 10 e-commerce sites, you can see that uh, those 10 account for 36% uh, of, uh, of, of traffic. Um, I wanted to contrast this against the offline world. Um, intuitively, you'd think that online is much more distributed than, on, than offline. Um, in red, essentially, this is the, uh, the revenue of uh, UK retailers. And if you look at the top 10 UK retailers, including heavyweights like Tesco, they account for 34% of, uh, of, of UK retail revenue. If you look at the uh, top 100, they account for 70%. So sure enough, beyond the top 100, online is uh, more widely distributed. But actually, um, within the top 100, e-commerce is actually even more concentrated than, uh, than the offline world. And so the shape of the distribution is actually really um, quite unusual in the online world in that you have this long, long shallow tail, but a very high concentration of visits right up the front. The implication of this is that <coughs> If you're a small operation in e-commerce and you, uh, you want to try to increase your online footprint, you really need to take advantage of the large channels which can get you in front of all of those site visits. The, uh, the final type of tail that I wanted to talk about um, is a little more unusual. It's, uh, it's one about building customer relationships. And the business I was going to talk about is uh, Marco's favorite band, um, Lady Gaga. And so Lady Gaga actually has a really interesting approach to thinking about the long tail. And um, in this case, we've got on the vertical axis her uh, gross earnings. And along the horizontal axis, the types of activity that she does. And you can see that concerts are a huge thing for her. Music is another big... Uh, big earner, at least for uh, her label, 216 million there. She does advertising as well. And she's got a huge number of these free activities where she engages with her, her customers, her users. And one of the really interesting things about Lady Gaga is um, she has deliberately gone about this free activity much, uh, much more aggressively than other artists. Um, she waived copyright on um, on anything uploaded to YouTube for fans to record her stuff in concerts. And so from early on in her career, she would encourage her fans to go to concerts, record things on video, whatever, music tracks, upload them to YouTube, and this started generating more and more interest in her. And uh, <clears throat> this activity, it's led to her getting one billion plays on YouTube. And you may be asking, okay, well, you know, what's the causality? How does this feed back into where the money is? And actually, the causality is, is, is pretty good. There was a single that she released in uh, November 2009 um, called Telephone. And uh, it made it to about number 25 in the charts when it was released. And earlier this year, in March 2010, um, she released a YouTube video um, it was a 10 minute long video um, made especially with YouTube in mind. The interest in that actually drove a lot of buzz around the song. There were 17 times more uh, Google searches for Lady Gaga Telephone 
when she released the video four months after the single actually came out than when the single came out. And uh, the single came back into the charts and it actually uh, came back into the charts, not just at 25, but came back into the charts at number one. So it was a really interesting uh, evidence that there's this causality that the free activity she was doing was a leading indicator of what was driving the money at the uh, at, at this front of the tail. Um, now, the implication here is for you to think about in your e-commerce businesses and your online retail activity, how are you using free stuff to start developing a habit with your customers, a relationship? Um, now, before you go out and buy bubble dresses, um, you you know, you can relax. You don't need to do quite so much the shock tactics of Lady Gaga. Um, Amazon, for example, has used a lot of free activities that go beyond normal retail in order to help to build that habit. And so, for example, um, we will, in, in 1995, Amazon started doing product reviews, customer reviews on the website, and, uh, and we allowed negative customer reviews. And suppliers and, uh, and other retailers thought that that was madness. Um, and at the increment, it may not contribute to a sale, but it develops a habit where the customers trust and build a relationship and they come back to the site again. Another example is uh, Universal Wishlist. Um, we've had a wishlist functionality on Amazon for a while now where customers can essentially add items that they may want to buy later. Um, we've upgraded that so that you can add anything at all. It doesn't need to be something that you buy on Amazon. Um, it can just be something that makes the wish list feature more convenient for you. Again, it's something which at the increment, at, at the first order effect, is not one where it drives revenue. But what it does do is create this habit, this relationship with the customer, which ultimately can feed back into the, uh, into the, the revenue bearing part of the distribution. So um, just to recap, um, these four different types of long tails that I talked about, really you need to think about how to, how to build the range um, because there's potential for it to go far beyond where many categories are operating right now. Think about how that range affects uh, obscure tastes because the reality is you're all a little bit quirky and sometimes you go somewhere and they just don't have what you want and, and you want to engage with your customers and bring them back. Uh, think about the fact that the distribution of stores is actually not that, that wide in terms of where the visits are really happening. And so think about channels and how that can help your footprint. And also um, think about how to develop those customer habits using a tail of free activity in order to drive the revenue. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, some uh, businesses that have been particularly sophisticated in these areas, we've got one of them up next, uh, Love Film.